One of my students' most common questions is, are you going to blow something up today? Well, when we get to gas laws, I tell them, we're going to blow something up today. And then I do this. <laughs> that only works once or twice throughout the year, because then they start getting a little angry at me. But I did blow it up. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you some of the gas law stations I set up around the room. And you can see in the front, I have four of them set up here. And what I do is that I have nine total. They're set up around the room. This is before we've ever mentioned names like Boyle or Charles. It's before we've given them, I've given them any information about the gas laws. I haven't even mentioned the term gas laws. I just say we're going to explore uh, some things about gas pressure and temperature and volume. And in their explorations, they need to draw pictures for me because this is a completely conceptual lab. There's no math involved. There's no memorization of gas laws involved. So I start with the balloon. And I teach them by modeling to them how I want these things drawn. So let's walk over to the board. OK. We're talking about gas. And most of what we're going to do here, we're going to include pressure in. So I draw a balloon. And I'm not a good artist. And I tell the students this right away. They need to be able to draw these things. And if they don't draw well, it doesn't matter. So I draw a deflated balloon. Okay. There's no air inside it. So we still have pressure on the balloon. It's just on the outside of the balloon only. When they inflate the balloon, mm -hmm. now we have pressure. Let me erase those arrows. We have pressure inside the balloon as well as pressure outside the balloon. And I encourage them to draw equal number of arrows to indicate that the pressure inside the balloon is equal to the pressure outside. How do we know that? We know that because the balloon's not getting any bigger and it's not getting any smaller. So the push, we always talk about pressure as a push is equal on both the inside of the balloon and the outside of the balloon. So they need to be able to draw those things. And when we take care of the, when we do the other gas stations as they go around, they're going to see a piece of paper at each station with specific questions on it, with directions on what I want them to draw. You can use, you can take any concept you want that involves gases and make up a station about it. We're going to start with seeing how temperature affects volume. So we've got a mylar balloon up front. And if we can get a close up on the back of this balloon, what I did was I took a little drinking straw, and I cut it small, and I taped it to the back of the balloon. And that serves as a holder for this string, which I don't know if you can see or not. It's just fishing line taped anchored at the bottom, and it's also anchored at the top so that it's taut. This is my guide wire, and the balloon is free to go up and down. When I went to the store to buy the balloon, I asked for them not to fill it all the way, because I want some room for expansion. And as I was checking out, the woman said, well, they can fill that up for you. I said, no, this is the way I want it. And in fact, I may let some more air out, or some more helium out. But it is filled with helium. And at the bottom, I have paper clips, and it's trial and error. How many paper clips do you need to get the balloon to stay down, but be able to rise as well? And I can leave this up for a few days, but even a mylar balloon over time loses some helium. So the second day, I may have to take off one of the paper clips, or I've even cut paper clips in half just to get the right mass to hold the balloon down. OK, this is set up for them. And if you have a hot light bulb, a heat lamp, you won't even have to touch it. You just have it set up in a corner of the room. And if, if the conditions are right, if the humidity is good, then it'll work all day long. If it doesn't, you can help it along 
This is just a heat gun. It's a paint stripping gun. Okay. It's like a hair dryer, except it doesn't blow as much air and it gets hotter. And so what I'm going to do is heat the balloon. Now, what I, I don't tell the kids this because it's going up and down several times, but what I want them to focus on and what the questions lead them to without being too blatant is what they're looking for is that the volume is going to increase. So right here, I've got a section of balloon that I've intentionally collapsed a little extra. So we're going to look at that section of the balloon as I heat it. And we should be able to see that as I heat the balloon, the air inside is going to increase in temperature. And that collapsed section of the balloon is going to fill. And as it fills, and of course we don't tell the kids this right away either. Sometimes you have to help it a little bit. As that fills, we've increased the volume without increasing the mass. And therefore the density should decrease. And it should rise on its own. Then it's going to stay at the top, and the kids will walk away and say, get back there, you're not done. And if we continue to watch the balloon, we should see now that as the balloon cools, it's also shrinking. Now again, they're supposed to discover these things for themselves. As it shrinks, the volume changes without the mass changing, and therefore the density decreases. And if you've got a heat lamp, and so the kids don't have to use the heat gun. If, if I had the heat gun there, I would be monitoring this one because the rest of them don't need monitoring. Um, if you've got a heat lamp set up and it's working, you, the kids can watch it go up and down three or four times before they finally realize, oh, wait a minute, it's getting bigger every time. And when it's up there, it's getting smaller. Um, the whole point is for them to discover that themselves. Okay. All right. Um, one of the other things I do is I want them to explore pressure and volume relationship. And a good way to do that, a good way to do volume of a gas is with a syringe. Actually, we could probably set that up right there. This syringe has a cap on the end to keep the air trapped inside. It's got nice, neat measurements on it. Okay. So I tell them to set it to uh, a specific measurement and keep it there and then cap it so the air is trapped. And we can see that when we press the syringe down, it pops right back up because there's air in there and the air is exerting a pressure on the plunger. So we put that inside the, blue, inside the bottle. I'd love to use plastic bottles. Um, use them for most of these stations, as you can see. And on this one, I use a bicycle pump. Now the bicycle pump has a pressure gauge on it. And this pressure gauge measures in pounds per square inch. That's okay. We haven't taught them anything about the different measurements of pressure yet. We haven't taught them tor or atmospheres or anything. Just the fact that you can measure pressure. And on the end of it, I already have this set up, so I'm going to show you a different one. What I've done is I've taken a regular pop bottle cap, drilled a hole in it, and how did I know what size to drill the hole? This is a uh, replacement valve for a tire. This one happens to be a larger size for a truck tire. They come smaller for car tires. And they've got this nice big fat end so that when you stick them through the cap and push, they lock in place. And now I have a valve for the top of my bottle. Uh, Flynn also sells them already made. Be careful. They've changed the way they make bottles now, or caps anyway. If we can notice the difference between those two caps, they're starting to save on plastic, which is a wonderful thing. But it's making uh, the caps not work as well, because there are only two threads on the new, two rows of threads on the new caps. The old ones have three. The, the more threads you have on your bottle, the better this is going to hold. And the better, as you can see later when we use fizz keepers, the better they will hold. So if you can hang on to the bottles with the bigger caps, do that. Okay. I just had my shop teacher drill these holes for me. All right. So what are we going to do here? Actually, um, I would prefer a little help on this one. 
This is definitely a two-person job. Jamie's going to help. And I, would you want it up or down? Or? OK. <laughs> I don't encourage this in the classroom. I'm going to uh, screw the bottle onto the cap. And the kids need the, um, let's stop rolling, please. They need to be able to see the measurements on the syringe and hold this tightly. They need to hold this because sometimes the cap, the, sometimes the pressure gets too great for the cap or the cap's not screwed on tightly and it may pop off. So I've got it aimed away from me. I don't have a lab partner over here. I'm holding the bottle. And Jamie, go ahead and start pumping. There we go. And what we should be able to see is that as we increase the pressure inside the bottle, it's not, why is that not working? The bottle's definitely getting tauter. There we go. The syringe will start moving. And I tell them not to try to prove how macho they are, we can probably stop now. Because if they let too, if they fill this bottle too full, we've got a lot of pressure here. Make sure they release the pressure before they open the bottle. Thank you. Do you need help? Okay. Open the carefully, point it away from you, because if it's if there's too much pressure in here, it's going to pop off. Now what I have them do is I actually have them collect data on this one. And it's not the most accurate data, but it's, it works. And what they, I do is I say read the pressure on the gauge, read the volume on the syringe, because what we're interested in is the air inside the syringe, and put it in a table. And then tell me what the relationship is. And it should be very clear that the higher the pressure, the smaller the volume in the syringe. So now we've developed a mathematical relationship without calling it, without using the term math. And uh, we haven't given him a gas law yet. So it's a very conceptual understanding of Boyle's law. All right. We need to talk about temperature and pressure. I just got a liquid crystal thermometer from a pet food pet store. Uh, it's a fish aquarium thermometer. I've taped it to the end of the Fizz Keeper. Actually, I didn't even have to tape it because they are sticky. If we peel off the back, and I only peeled off a small portion of it. It's meant to stick to the inside of the aquarium. Fizz keepers are great for gas law problems and other things you can do in your classroom. They're lousy for what they were made to do, which is to keep the fizz in your pop. And we talk about that later. Um, I can very quickly say that the point is, on a fizz keeper, you're pumping air into the bottle. And what you're trying to keep in your pop is carbon dioxide. So putting air into your bottle will not increase the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the soda. So they don't work for that. So I tell the kids, if you have any at home, they're not going to work for you. Bring them into me. And I, they'll get a couple a year. Most people don't have them. So we have to buy them. Uh, Flynn sells them. Sometimes you can find them at um, flea markets. OK, what we're going to do here, and this one isn't the one I just did with the bicycle pump is probably the most dangerous only because people try to see if they can blow up the bottle. So I have to watch that one and make sure that they're not going overboard. This one, I don't know if they, I, I don't tell them they can't blow up the bottle because that's a challenge. But um, what we're going to do here is look at the temperature. And the temperature, sometimes there's two different temperatures showing a color. I tell them to pick a color. In this case, that kind of brown color is showing at the 78 degrees Fahrenheit. I say stick with that one. Sometimes they pick the blue color. Sometimes there's even a green color. And I have them make sure it's nice and tight, pump it five times, record five pumps, temperature, pump it five times, record five pumps and the temperature, or 10 pumps in the temperature. And I'm going to speed through this and show that as they pump this up, the temperature will rise. I like this better than a, than a typical glass uh, laboratory thermometer. There we go. We're into the, the brown is into the 82 now. 
and we can keep going with this. What we're doing is we're increasing pressure inside the bottle and the temperature is going up. Now we have a pressure temperature relationship. An alternative to this, to having this as stations, is just to get one of these bottles, and a two liter might even work better, and pass it around the room. Have somebody do five pumps, record the temperature on the board. Have the next person do five more pumps, record the temperature on the board. And I don't know if you can make it all the way around the room, usually you can't because the bottle's too taut by that point. But we can certainly determine that the more pumps, the more, the higher the temperature. And if, if the number of pumps is representing our pressure, now we've got a pressure temperature relationship. Okay. All right. Well, we've done pressure volume, we've done pressure temperature. Now, uh, this is still pressure volume. Um, what I have in here is a uh, ketchup packet and an eyedropper. Now, this one is very difficult for the kids to get, and, and it's my favorite because even when they think they have it figured out, I'll come and ask them a question and try and confuse them because they don't have it figured out. So I'll show you what happens, and then we'll try to figure this out together. Another fizz keeper, it's full of water. The eyedropper is mostly full of air. The ketchup packet is the way it came from the store. And you got to play around for ketchup packets because some of them don't float. But this one does. And I make sure it's screwed on tight. And I pump the bottle. And what I want them to see is what's happening inside the eyedropper. And if they can see it, what's happening to the ketchup packet? That's not always so visible. So let's focus on the eyedropper first. Yeah, that ketchup packet wants to be in the way. The eyedropper is filling with water. Does that mean the air is coming out of the eyedropper? Well, no. If the air were coming out of the eyedropper, we'd see bubbles. And we don't see bubbles. So what's happening to the air inside the eyedropper? It's being compressed. All the air that was in there to begin with is still in there because we didn't see any bubbles. But it's taking up less volume. Okay, so we're doing a pressure-volume relationship. Also, since the eyedropper is filling with water, the eyedropper is becoming heavier and therefore more dense. So we should be able to get that eyedropper to sink all the way to the bottom. Well, now wait a minute. The ketchup packet is also sinking. Why would the ketchup packet sink? I'm not pumping water into the ketchup packet. So I'm not increasing the mass of the ketchup packet. I must be changing the other thing that affects density, which would be volume. And most of the kids, if, and you might need to pull some teeth on this one, will remember that there is a little bit of air inside the ketchup packet. And as you pump on the bottle, you're increasing the pressure, which will be compressing that air, causing the ketchup packet to take up less volume. The eyedropper is more mass. That's why it's sinking. The ketchup packet is less volume, but the same mass. And that's why it's sinking. That's a tough one for them. They have to remember density, and no matter how well you drill density into their heads, they still have a problem with that. So this could actually be used as a density demonstration as well as a gas law demonstration. There are other things I set up around the room. These aren't the only ones. This is just a sample. I love to do stations because I only have to set up one of everything. And these are stations that are pretty foolproof. There's no dangerous chemicals involved. The uh, only safety I worry about is the bicycle pump, so I keep an eye on that. Um, not much the kids can ruin because it's all cheaply replaced if they do. And they get a very good conceptual understanding of gas laws. What I do to assess this is I don't collect their labs because they tend to be kind of sloppy and hard to read. I quiz them a couple of days later, I leave it set up long enough that if they need to come back after school and do it again because they just didn't see it the first time. And then I give them an open note quiz so they have their notes with them where they did their drawings and they have their relationships between temperature and pressure and temperature and volume. And that's easy for me to grade and it's a good way for me to see whether they took good notes and understood the concepts. So that's how I do gas, that's how I introduce gas laws. and. Uh, Thank you.